most in the country. And Mr. Obama doesn't even have to campaign in the Golden State. He'll win it no matter what. But why? Joining us now from Los Angeles political observer, Adam Carolla. So why can't a republic? I guess you, you could have Mother Teresa running. You could have, the, you know, this, one of the saints come down and Barack Obama would still win. Why? Well, um, question is, first off, no one from California is from California. I'm the only one who's from California. Uh, everyone from California is either from New York or Tijuana. So it's kind of a <laughs> mixed batch of people in here. Mm -hmm. it's, it's really the most progressive, sort of self-aggrandizing folks or the poorest folks coming in from different directions, but it's a bizarre mixed batch in California, but nobody's from here. But there are a lot of states that are melting pots, Texas, Arizona, down on the border, certainly, New York, uh, but New York will vote for Barack Obama almost no matter what. But what is it about California that drives the vote into the Democratic precincts when the Democrats have controlled Sacramento for what, two decades now? Your state is bankrupt. People are moving out of it. It's chaotic. Yes. And they still keep voting Democrat, Democrat, Democrat. I don't understand. Well, I, I think the unions have taken control. And I mean, the teachers' unions, the prison guard unions, just about every union here in California. So it's very union oriented, but it's not business oriented. And big business is considered the devil here in California. And we drive them out and we replace them with more federal jobs and more unions and that's why we're bankrupt but that's where the votes are coming from okay so you the uh, unionized workforce we got to get a stat on that now the big uh, population centers like los angeles san francisco not so much san diego san diego is a little more conservative they go for uh, the democrats no matter what they like the progressive vision but again the social problems in los angeles are are huge it's an enormously complex city and things aren't working that well, and the economy's not that good there. So you would think that they would, they, I don't even think they listen to the Republican side. They don't even listen. They have NPR on all day and all night. They just, they're just listening to that. They won't even watch. Actually, the Fox News Channel gets a lot of viewers, but it's a mindset out there. And the mindset is, we want what? What are Californians, what is their priority? Well, the, the problem is, is we don't really have a priority other than just sort of good vibes and mamas and the papas and California dreaming and, you know, uh, Pacific Coast Highway and Malibu. Like, we're laid back and the Democrats are the party of the we're cool, we're laid back, we're friendly, we're compassionate. The Republicans are, hey, pull yourself up by your bootstraps and get to work. And we don't like those hours in California. We want to hang out and do a little surfing when the tide is low. So part of it is just the fact that we look at ourselves like San Francisco and Los Angeles is nice. And we look at the Democrats as the nice party. Okay, so Californians don't want confrontation. They don't want to be challenged and be self-reliant. They want everybody to get along and uh, the government to provide a lot of services and stuff. Um, but when you do that, then the government has more power telling you what to do so you can't buy a goldfish in San Francisco. You can get heroin for free, but you can't buy a goldfish. It just seems that there's something going on out there that, that just doesn't add up. I know. I had to go to New Mexico to buy my kid a goldfish two weeks ago. <laughs> Damn thing died in the trunk on the way back. It, it did. Was hot. Okay, now if yeah, you had been caught... Yeah, I should have put it up in the car with me. If you had been caught you would have gotten far more for smuggling a goldfish into San Francisco than you would if you had been an illegal alien crossing the border into uh, Imperial County. So you would have gotten, you would probably sure. would have got one to three, whereas the other one you would have just got released. Would have been funny if I was sitting in a cell with a guy and he said, what are you in for? And I said, smuggling goldfish. And he said, me too, brother. <laughs> and we should explain to people that the uh, City uh, Council of San Francisco believes it is cruel to have a goldfish in a tank. And therefore, as uh, Mr. Crowell rightly pointed out, California got to be nice so you can't have the goldfish. Last word, Adam? That's right. Well, you know, it's all about the environment. It's all about good vibes. And it's all about hope and change and being nice and not being the man and not being a big corporation and working for the man. And that's what California is about. All right. Thing going on. owes China $1.2 trillion because Chinese investors have bought off U.S. bonds and this country needs their money to cover the vast deficit we have. 
Joining us now from our New York studio, Peter Kernan, author of the big new bestseller, Becoming China's Bitch. The title referring to street language that implies one person dominating another. Let's start with the USA selling oil products to China while prices are going up here. What's going on with that, Mr. Kiernan? Well, we have a basic problem, which is we're incenting companies to take crude oil, refine it into special oil and distillates, and sell it outside the United States. And so we've gone from one million barrels a day of that to two million barrels plus a day of that. Right now, we're sitting here with a daily usage of, let's call it 19 million barrels a day. And we have to bring about half of that in from overseas. I worry when refiners say this is a win-win. I don't see how this is a win-win for the U.S. economy. All right, so 19 million is what the U.S. consumers use every day. All right, 2 million barrels go out. If it stayed here, that would bring it down to 17. And then we produce 8.5 of that, or half from, from the United States. And then we import, um, basically what you're saying is we import close to 9 uh, million barrels of oil a day from OPEC and other oil-producing nations. Now, why, you know, this is what gets me. The oil companies say it's a free marketplace, even though they have to get very special permission to operate under the government, and you can't found an oil company, neither can I. All right, so it's really not free, but they say it is. So under a free marketplace banner, they're entitled to sell any oil they refine here in the United States to anybody they want, and China will pay more for it. So what's wrong with that? You know, I'll take issue with the free market. Nothing is free. We spend a lot of money to protect that oil. A lot of the oil that we're going to use in the next few months is not on our shores. It's on a ship out at sea, and we're protecting that. We're protecting it through the Straits of Hormuz or wherever it's coming from to our shores. And so the oil companies are getting a great big subsidy in the form of that protection. Now, one of the things that's happened is because we've done such a bad job of mining our own assets or drilling our own oil, we've added two additional wrinkles to the classic supply-demand equation. Those are, number one, logistics, and number two, speculation. And it shouldn't be the case, but those are now just as important as supply and demand. Yeah, well, we're going to talk about speculation. Lou Dobbs coming right up. But All right, and the other um, deal is that China seems to defy the United States every day. Best example being Iran. China's pretty much their big patron now. Everybody else is isolating them. Even Russia is starting to cooperate now a little bit. But China now vetoes anything they can to help Iran and still trades with Iran at a very high level, correct? You're absolutely right. China right now buys about 20% of all Iran's oil exports. That's more than the entire EU combined. In fact, four countries buy most of Iran's oil exports. China, India, Japan, and Turkey. Why that's important is we're in the middle of trying to do something important for world peace, which is embargo and put economic pressure on Iran to prevent them from building nuclear weapons. People compare it to the Cuban Missile Crisis, except unlike us, where we could surround Cuba, Iran is getting a back door to sell their oil to China. China is working directly cross-purposes to U.S. interests in Iran. Okay, so we can't do anything because the Chinese do not fear the United States anymore, knowing that we owe them more than a trillion dollars. We need their trade and all of that. So China pretty much does whatever they want, correct? You know, they do, and I'll give you a more recent example just to your point. You know, we've had a lot of influence on the Security Council, and we have not liked the way um, things are, are, are happening in Syria and, and the way they're literally killing their own people. We wanted at the Security Council to Im influence it by having a resolution. Guess who said no once again? China. Right. China's got an independent favor, and we have got to do something to tame it. But we can't do anything because they hold so much of our debt. We can't do anything to them. You know, I think it's one of those things where it's hard to be too tough when your banker is also your major supplier, but you have to have an embrace, and I think it's fair and reasonable to confront them where they're being unfair, and there are a bunch of areas where they're being unfair. All right, but I think they've tried to confront them, and the Chinese made it quite clear they're going to do, they're going to do exactly what they want to do, and they don't really care what we say. You know, part of it is we have not really developed much of a relationship. We have not watched them nearly as closely as they're watching us. All right, Ms. Kiernan, thanks very much. Very provocative book.